Hi, welcome back. Last week we discussed uh, the dialectical logic of development with the uh, notion of the negation of the negation. This week we're going to discuss something kind of related, like the next step, which is the dialectical logic of uh, complex systems and how those change uh, over time. Now, <clears throat> absolutely essential for understanding this is grasping the dialectical contradiction of the universal and the individual, or the, gen the part and the whole, shall we say. And <clears throat> this really gets at one of the fundamental problems of philosophy, which is whether or not universal concepts such as animal or colour or any concept like that, whether or not they have a real existence uh, or are just fictions of them, like convenient fictions perhaps, but have no real existence as such. Um, now, our starting point on this is going to be the nature of thought itself. Thought is inherently universalizing. Okay, We deal with universals whenever we think it's unavoidable. And that's what separates thought from mere instinct and sensation. Hegel frequently pointed this out, in fact, when he said that it is impossible to speak uh, of the purely individual thing because as soon as you do, you make it a universal. For, so, for example, if I were to say this leaf is green, I'm actually making it a universal twice or I'm linking it to the universal twice. I'm saying it, that this thing, this individual object is a leaf, which is a universal thing. And also that it's green, so it's a colour, which is, of course, also a universal thing. And Hegel points out that if you leave these universal determinations out and merely say this in an attempt to make it really individual, in fact, you end up making it even more universal because, of course, everything can be described as this. In order to make it more particular, more concrete, you have to give it these universal determinations. You have to say it's green, it's a leaf, you know, it's large, it's small, etc. So this kind of reveals the way in which thought is inherently about uh, universals, or rather it links the individual to the universal, it synthesizes them, shall we say. Now idealists like Plato have argued that these universals are the real truth, the real essence of existence, they're the most profound thing. And not only that, but they actually have a real existence. In other words, they actually exist. There is a kind of an ideal leaf, there is pure greenness. And all of the manifestations of these ideas are just that, they're just worse manifestations, if we like, imperfect forms of the, um, of the ideal form that exists somewhere else in a kind of heavenly realm, shall we say. Now, this concept usually strikes us as quite strange in, today, in today's more scientific uh, world. However, actually, in one form or another, this kind of idealist uh, error really is still much more prevalent than we might think. So, for example, uh, God itself is a form of this idea, the idea of, uh, of a God. Uh, it, because on the one hand, this God is obviously a universal, is the essence of the universe, created the universe, unites it, is the reason that the universe is the way it is, etc. And yet at the same time, is treated as a concrete being, as a distinct thing that has a real existence, right? So once again, this idea of universals having a, a real and a prior or superior existence to concrete material things. Um, and that, that is essentially the essence of this outlook, that the universal is, a prior to, is prior to the concrete particular forms of it, if you like. And, um, and again, we find this in other forms as well. We find it quite frequently actually in science, not usually stated in that way, uh, but science, especially I think when a science is, is a particular branch of science is new, you, uh, and, and in, in older science, you often find this kind of, this error really. So for example, in the past, it was thought that heat was determined by having hot force and cold force. In other words, these universal properties were rather than seen as being from the objects themselves, but somehow outside of the objects as distinct concrete uh, things that were then sort of imposed onto them and gave them their qualities. Um, and in fact, in, in another sense, you also find this kind of error of idealism uh, in politics. When people say things, for example, when discussing the problems of capitalism and they describe those problems as fundamentally about greed, which is usually what people say, when they describe that, that it's greed that is the cause of the problems, 
and that the solution to this must be to pick different universal values, such as, I don't know, altruism or something, and um, and then you know go with those, and then society won't be won't have so many problems. That, in a sense, is a form of the same error of thought because it, it it assumes that these values have some sort of independent existence, almost as if there's a place that they exist, and you can pluck this or that idea at uh, at your will, uh, separate from the material conditions, and then sort of impose it onto society somehow. Um, so this is a very real problem, even though it might seem, when it's stated bluntly, as slightly ridiculous. Now, of course, as materialists, we do reject this outlook, right? Because it is an idealist outlook. Um, I, you know, universals do not exist as such. There is no place in which you can find pure colour or something like that. There are only, there's only this or that object with this or that form of that colour. Um, now, Hegel was, of course, himself an idealist, and in many respects, he did reproduce this error. But at other times, he understood it very well and criticised it. So, for example, in uh, the introduction to the shorter logic, uh, he says the following, and I quote, When the universal is made a mere form and coordinated with the particular, as if it were on the same level, it sinks into a particular itself. Even common sense in everyday matters is abo above the absurdity of setting a universal besides the particulars. Would anyone who wished for fruit reject cherries, pears and grapes on the ground that they were cherries, pears and grapes and not fruit? Uh, in other words, what he's saying is that for a universal to be a universal, it cannot exist as such. As soon as you were to make it an object, even if it's a very good object, better than all the others, it's merely a particular. It's just one object amongst many. He also says in the Phenomenology of Spirits that and again I quote, should it appear contradictory to say that the absolute has to be conceived essentially as a result, a little consideration will set this appearance of contradiction in its true light. If we say all animals, for example, that does not pass for zoology. So in other words, what he is saying here, which we as Marxists agree with, is that if you abstract the universal from its conditions and, and, and pretend that it creates those conditions, then you are left with a kind of inexplicable senselessness. You know, zoology by itself is just a phrase. Uh, to, to give it any real content, you have to actually study the particular things that make it up. And if you remove it from that, then again, it just becomes a particular itself. Um, he also says that the laws of the universe are not inscribed in the sky. They cannot be seen or heard. It's again the same point that you cannot find a place in which the laws sort of exist in pure form or something and then are imposed onto the universe. However, he then reveals his idealism when he says that these universal laws exist only for the mind. They cannot be seen, but they can be apprehended with the mind. And I think that he is beginning to slip into his idealism by sort of suggesting that there that there's some sort of other realm of mind that in which universals reside, which isn't quite what Marxists think, and I'll explain that. Marx also ridicules this kind of idealist error, you know, the error of treating universals as having an independent existence. Uh, in The Holy Family, one of his earlier books, where he says that, um, you know, he takes, he takes the absurdity of it, but he shows that if you if you think that, for example, fruit, again, the, for some reason, the example of fruit, if you take uh, fruit as having an independent existence and a, and a superior existence to its actual manifestations as apples and pears or anything else, then the only way you can explain the actual existence of concrete apples and pears is by sort of saying that for some mystical reason, the fruit, the ideal fruit, must manifest itself, must sort of unfold itself into all these different forms. But of course, if that's the position, it, it remains a complete mystery as to why that happens. And that that is the same argument that we would make, or one of the same arguments that we would make against any notion of, of God as a creator of the universe. Because the question always arises, well, why did God, if God is everything and is, is sort of self-sufficient and uh, perfect, then what motivated God to create the universe at that particular time? And what motivated him to make it in this way and not that way? Why was it given these properties and not some other superior properties? And 
nobody can answer that question because God is defined to begin with as perfect and superior to his creation. So for materialists, we start out from the concrete material things. That is absolutely fundamental. The material world is the prior thing. That is what really exists. Concrete, specific material objects, they are what is real. Do we then deny the existence of universals? Do we say that these concepts such as colour um, or shape or whatever, cause and effect, time, etc. Do we say that these universals are not true, that they're just convenient fictions of the mind? This does also relate to the stuff that we discussed in earlier weeks, if you remember, on you know, the problem of knowledge, for example. And of course, we don't deny that they exist. If you do, that is essentially positivism. And the error of positivism is that in what positivism basically states is that only fact, only concrete facts of, you know, basically individual instances of things, you know, concrete events, they are the only thing that has truth um, or that we can know. And therefore, any sort of broader category or generalisation is untrue or is unfounded, essentially. Um, and so theoretical generalisations are essentially ruled out by positivism. And the trouble with that is, once again, we always end up finding that, you, that thought can't do without universals. Thought is inherently about universals and generalisations. And so if you write that out, you slip back into idealism because you end up concluding that those universals that we do clearly use are, again, just conventions, just arbitrary inventions of the mind, essentially. And, and, and we reject that as materialists, as consistent materialists. If we, if we think about it, any real object that exists, any, any physical material object, is actually not really so unique. Of course, each object is different, that's true. But actually, everyone fits into a type. They will be made up of molecules and atoms, and there's only so many elements that exist, um, and we find them repeated again and again in the universe. And we find that all the objects are composed of these you know, general forms of matter which obey predictable laws. And of course, if you go further into, for example, the organic world, into life, we find that there are definite species. And it's true, each member of that species is different from the next, but only so different. In reality, they are all, they all conform more or less, or the vast majority of them conform to their type and are predictable in the way that they behave. That really applies across the universe. And that, of course, is the reason where we are able to make universalizations which are useful otherwise our universalizations would you know why would they work why would they correspond to our life and be useful there'd be no basis for saying that at all again it would just be random or luck or arbitrary um, so in reality things conform very much to their type to it or to a very large extent to the type the universe is predictable we can generalize and of course that's the basis of human society as well the fact that we can create tools that are that work in predictable ways that are made of you know certain kinds of material that we find consistently in the world and it's reliable that it does work in that way that is obviously the basis of the entirety of human society we couldn't do that we couldn't uh, create useful things useful technology with which to live better and that again that's the basis of of society or of, or of civilization so this or that object is, yes, it is, it is unique and it, yes, it passes away. Everything is finite, everything dies or, or is destroyed at a certain point. But the new things that emerge in their place are also not so different. We find that, again, there's this tremendous regularity in things. So behind or after all of this flux, if you like, of, of imperfect concrete particulars, we find there is an abiding kind of image that, that we are given. Certain predictable law, certain regularity that we do find in the universe. And we can call these laws, basically, the reason why things behave in certain ways, essentially. That's what a law is. Um, and therefore, these universals are, are real, in a sense, and they are enormously important. In a sense, a, a true universal or a law, a correctly understood law, is more important, in a sense you could say even more true, than any fleeting instance of it, if you like. Um, does that mean, mean that we're, ide we're returning to idealism then because of this, by holding up the universal uh, as superior somehow to the concrete manifestations of it? Well, to resolve this problem, we have to use dialectical logic. 
In other words, a logic based on the inseparability of opposites and the idea that the opposites condition and define one another. We have to get away from this thinking in terms of absolute antithesis. So it's either, you know, that there's only concrete objects, concrete material objects, and universals are just fictions. Or on the other hand, that the universals are the only thing that exists and they have a real physical existence and everything else is an imperfect kind of manifestation of them. Both of those are two op are opposite extremes which taken by themselves are false. For us, yes, we start out with the concrete material objects. Of course, those are those are the starting point for any materialist. But, as I said, these objects fit into a type. And to, to, to help us understand this and how it is dialectical, let's take a, an example. Let's return to this example of fruit. And let's take an apple, for example. Now, a specific apple that we might have in front of us, that certainly exists. It is definitely real, obviously. But at the same time, it is an apple. It isn't just this individual thing in front of us. It, is, it does correspond to a type. Now, how did it get that appleness, if we like, if we can call it that? Where does that come from? Was there an ideal apple that somehow imposed onto all of this chaos of matter the form of the apple? Obviously not. That would be the, the mechanism by which that would happen would be absolutely inexplicable. That's clearly not what happens. An apple has appleness because of the prior history of apples and indeed of evolution in general. It can only be an apple because before it there was an apple tree and there were seeds that were produced. And of course an apple tree can only do that because there's an environment in which it exists, with it, which it is nourished by, and which it is adapted for. And it can only be adapted for it because of a long prior history of evolution, essentially. That is how an apple becomes an apple. So an apple is, in a sense, more than itself. It is more than merely this particular object. It has general or universal appleness within itself. It has, if you like, crystallized within itself the past forms of all of this development. And also it has the future because it's in its own nature, of course, to produce seeds, to die, and for those seeds to be spread around and in turn produce further apple trees. So, yes, yeah, so in a sense, the, the universal does exist, but it exists within those objects. It helps to mold those objects. And it can do that, not because of any mystical force, but because of the real history of material development, the universal interaction of material objects over time. And it also it is the case that the, that the universal only exists through these particulars. So just as the particular has the universal, if you like, within it, the universal also is nothing other than the particulars that it is made up of. And those particulars have to do that because they are precisely because they are particulars. If you take, for example, your arm, that is merely a part of the whole of your body. And it can only, precisely because it is a part, it needs the rest of the body. It can only be a functioning arm because it's attached to a body with a heart that beats and blood and all the rest of it. That's what enables it to be an arm. So pre precisely the fact that it is merely a part is what binds it together into a definite whole. And the, what a universal is, what an, a correct universal law or concept is, is a, an adequate summation of that historical process of development, of the, 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 the laws of motion, if you like, of complexes of phenomena, such as apples or, or fruit or human bodies, etc. <clears throat> so that is how we sort of dialectically resolve this, this problem. Um, which is, as I said, is a huge problem of philosophy. Um, the, the problem of where universals come from and whether or not they are, they are, they are true. And the final thing that I want to, to say is this also helps us to understand, and we're going to discuss this in later weeks in more depth, it helps us to understand how lawfulness and determination really operate. Because if, the, if laws do exist, if you like, and are very important, but on the other hand, they don't exist in an ideal form separate from the matter that they um, express or the, that uh, they kind of, they, yeah, they express the lawfulness of that matter. If they don't exist separate from that, then it follows that the law is also, it's, it's a result of the particular formation that the parts are in, if you like. So take the example of society, which is very obviously as Marxist is, is, is what we're interested in. There are laws to society. So take capitalism. There is the law of economic crises. There are laws 
of revolution. We do find revolutions periodically take place and they have certain predictable features and the same, of course, for capitalist crises. But these laws, as I've said, do not exist outside of or prior to capitalist society. They exist in and through the many millions of individuals and the particular relations that those individuals have with one another. But of course, each capitalist society and each moment in the history of capitalism has different individuals, although only so different, of course. They're still composed of people belonging to definite classes like the proletariat, but nevertheless, concrete individuals with their own personal history and the particular relationship that they stand in is obviously slightly different in different points of history. It's an enormously complex uh, equation if you like and therefore although there's only so much variation that capitalism can tolerate and there will always be capitalist crises of a certain form that are similar basically there is also a uniqueness to each one because it can't exist separately from those particular people in that society. So the, the way in which a capitalist crisis will occur will be slightly unpredictable. It won't happen on an exact date that you can predict in advance and it won't necessarily have the exact same cause each time. But on the other hand, it would be absurd to deny common features and predictable, certain predictable features to capitalist crises. So that is why this kind of understanding is so important. It helps us to, to grasp scientifically that capitalist society and the world in general is lawful. Laws are real and, and we can apprehend them. But at the same time, these laws are not ever perfectly or sort of simplistically manifested. And therefore, we are not these kind of fatalists who just know how everything is going to happen in advance. Anyway, I'll stop there and I think we're going to go into a bit more detail into some of these questions uh, next week. So I'll see you then. Lenin stated that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Without a revolutionary theory, we are bound to take in the ideas that surround us. Under capitalism, these are ideas that ultimately defend the status quo. In Wellrad's upcoming book on the history of philosophy, Alan Woods looks at the development of philosophical thinking from the ancient Greeks all the way through to Marx and Engels, who brought together the best of previous thinking to produce the Marxist philosophical outlook, which looks at the real material world, not as a static, immovable reality, but one that is constantly changing and moving according to laws that can be discovered. Through this, we can learn how philosophy becomes an indispensable tool in the struggle for the revolutionary transformation of society. Pre-order your copy now at www.marxist.com slash HOP.